and welcome back, everybody, to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John, and I sit down here each and every week, and I answer your questions. This week, we're at episode 238, and I got to tell you, I say this every so often, but I'm amazed we've done it this many times. Uh, uh, I remember when Pat Flynn told me years ago that the, the average podcast makes it to like seven or something like that, uh, and I can understand why it would be difficult to keep bringing these out week after week, uh, but fortunately... Because of you and your questions, it's not so bad for me. Remember, if you have questions, send them to us at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one of them. Thank you. We have kind of a, we have a couple of interesting questions today. Uh, we have one question that I just think is out, just kind of funny. So uh, there's no real question in it, but it's a fun question. It's a fun statement. So we'll go through it. So we got Amato with us first. And the question is real simple and real true to my heart. He goes, how much do you need, uh, how much training do you need as you go into your 60s? Is it okay to train every day as we get older? Well, let me break down real fast uh, how uh, and I use Nick Rain's uh, numbers, and I've done that for a long time. Basically, up to about the age of 16 or 17, I think you should play as many sports, activities, you should learn gymnastics, how to ride a bike, how to swim, how to play every sport you can possibly be exposed to. Uh, have some fun. Uh, learn the values of team sports. Learn the values of individual sports. Play a lot of games. Learn how your body moves. Learn how to, you know, uh, climb ropes and, you know, do monkey bars and roll and tumble and break fall and all kinds of things, okay? Air Bear taught us this a uh, hundred and 200 years ago, nothing new under the sun. From about 17 to 34 or so, uh, those are the years we can just get about. We, and sadly, the the, the uh, fitness industry is based on the people in those age groups. You can do about anything then. You know, you can do a, like you can do zero carbs for a long time and, and, and still be fine. You can live on very little sleep and way too much partying and still look good. Uh, you can do those insane workouts and, and, Bounce out of the bed the next day and do it again. Then 35 hits. I think between 35 and 55 really is the most important time of your training career. Um, I think 35 to 55, it's like investing when you're like 18 to about 25. If you could fill up your uh, retirement, you know, put a lot of money into your retirement at age, you know, 18, 19, 20, whatever, and the, ma the, the magic of compound interest would set you up for life. Uh, if you can get your all the college degrees you can possibly can before the age of 22. You know, when I turned 22, I got my master's. Uh, I'm not bragging or anything. Uh, I got my bachelor's when I was 21. Uh, but what was nice about it, I was here I am, you know, starting as a teacher, and I've already taken care of all the big, the big heavy lifting. Um, so there is great value to being investing early in your education, investing early in retirement, but that 35 to 55 age group, that's when you invest for the long-term health span of your body, everything that happens over after, you know, 56. So get as strong as you can between the age of 35 and 55, maintain it, uh, do yourself a massive favor. I, I talk with my inner circle group. It's called, uh, you pay off your future self. Um, if you invest ten thousand dollars in a retirement account at age nineteen, and it's a, it's a standard, you know, kind of growth fund, you're you're done. I mean, the magic that that is such a great investment. Um, if you decide not to put on any excessive fat in your late twenties, your thirties, your forties, early fifties, your future self will love this idea. So I'm always thinking it's a weird thing to say like this, but. I don't know the values I will have in 10 or 15 or 20 years, and hopefully I'll be around. I'm look, hoping to do that, hoping to live well and take care of business. I don't know what 20 years from now me wants, but if I don't put on a lot of body fat, I keep my joints healthy, I keep some lean body mass, uh, you know, I take good care of my teeth, my eyes, my ears, my senses, uh, my brain, uh, Future self might have a whole different set of things future self, your little future Danny John wants to do, but I'll have some money for him and I'll have a body that's not too broken down. So now, 
After 56, I think you focus on basically three things. I think mobility comes first. Uh, now, that's not, that's, think, the better way to think of it is a triangle. And there's no first on this, but I'm going to talk about mobility first. And that's the free movement around all your joints. Well, you'll notice I, I do that. I've done this a number of times on the podcast. I start spinning my thumbs. I start spinning my fingers. I start spinning my wrist. I check my elbows out. Um, one of the things I picked up in the last uh, year or so is that I've noticed that my ankle mobility isn't where it needs to be. Now, all those years of Olympic lifting, I'm very mobile in this area, but I'm not necessarily as mobile on, in the arounds. So sometimes if you're in my house, you'll hear this kind of nasty crack, crack, and that's me uh, moving my ankle, and it's obvious when it cracks like that, something's going on, but I don't know what. Uh, Tim Anderson has a wonderful book called uh, Dynamic Hips, and I, I love reviewing that all the time. And to be honest, you know, to summarize, uh, this probably isn't fair to Tim, but to summarize the big three things in Tim's vocabulary, you know, uh, breathing through the diaphragm, using eye control during your movements and stretches and mobility work. And then the other thing, uh, what I really get a lot out of, uh, we crossing the X, you know, working one, one side to the other. For hips, for shoulders, uh, for huge parts of your body, uh, you know, practicing your breathing, using eye control as you, as you do a movement. So I'm going to leave my eyes into that stretch and my body will follow. And then trying to make sure I do a lot of these crossing movements. I mean, that's good. That's a good foundation for the mobility work I do. Second big key, again, it's a, it's a triangle would be, uh, maintaining as much lean body mass as we can. So hooray, hooray. Once you get over 56, you need to train like a bodybuilder. You need to up the reps a little bit. Um, you, you, you probably now at, in your fifties and late fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, hundreds and beyond, you know, it is it, certainly machine training has value. When I go down to the Murray Senior Center, um, uh, I, I will talk like with the interns and s about a year or so, one of them read a lot of my work and, I, and they said, oh, I thought you were against machines. Oh no, I'm not against machines. In fact, machine training is really good for many seniors. Now I like a combination of obviously kettlebells, dumbbells, barbells, suspension trainers, machines to hit all these different things. Uh, today when I was doing um, the, when I'm speaking today, uh, today is my day where I do my suspension trainer workout focus. And one of the things I try to do is I try to mess with my balance sometimes when I'm doing suspension training work. Go up on one foot, play around with a little bit of movement that challenges my balance. Uh, machines don't challenge your balance. and But that's okay, because their job is to help you build lean body mass. So after 55, 56, you know, sets of eight, sets of 10, sets of 12, even sets all the way up to 20 can have great value. Um, I have no issue with isolated uh, body part exercises. I think there's real value in them for many people, especially if you know your own particular physical history and you know your your gaps, your weak points and what you need to work. Um, one day a week, I spend almost the entire workout um, half the workout, uh, doing all the T's, the Y's, the I's, all the stuff that straightens me back up after years of sitting at a desk, years of, you know, being a thrower. I'm trying to undo, in a logical way, the, the damage of, of all the years that got me here. And the final thing in our third or the, the other tip of the pyramid is at some level you have to work your fast twitch muscle fibers. Now, I don't necessarily think you have to train, you know, pull out. I got the, the triple jump encyclopedia up there. And you don't need to train like a, a, a triple jumper. You don't need to do, <laughs> you don't need to leap over hurdles and boxes and, you know, do tons of single leg bounding. Uh, boy, it'd be great if you could. But, you know, now you're all, they have to slide over. That's a cost of benefit. Is that, is that bounding, the box jumping, is that going to be, you know, you hurt that ankle, you know, playing on the, on the beach in, you know, 1964, eh, that ankle might show up and be a little angry now as you're, you're as you're messing around with it. So 
when it comes to uh, fast twitch muscle fiber, uh, I think that through a little bit, uh, I personally like the kettlebell swing and all of its uh, progressions and regressions. Um, you know, one thing I do notice when I do the 10,000 swing challenge, as much as I hate it, and, and candidly, I hate it, is that at the end of it, uh, when I go coach my throwers and I pick up something and I throw it, uh, I, you can tell I've been working on my fast twitch muscle fibers. The kettlebell snatch might be another one. The Olympic lifts obviously would be another one. But you can also do something as simple as just, you know, um, you know, try to bound up a flight of stairs as appropriate. You know, uh, when you come to a curb, you know, don't just, you know, pop up on it like Clarence Bass taught us so many years ago. Uh, Terry Todd and Clarence Bass had this famous conversation where they talk about losing your spring in your step. And that is something I, I, I have been able to really keep at bay a little bit in, you know, as I'm, you know, I'm, let's see, I'm 67, you know, I'm, I'm closer to 70 than 60. And I read this when I was, I think, 40, 41, when I read that uh, article by Clarence Bass about spring. And I took it seriously then, and I think it was a good idea. So just kind of remember the triangle. You want to do mobility. You want to do some uh, hypertrophy work, bodybuilding work, and you want to do some fast twitch. So I love the workout generator for this because, you know, when you're doing a set of presses, you can mix it with mobility move on the ground. You do a set of pulls, you can mix it with a, a movement that you can do whatever, you know, I'm just, I don't know, I'm just free moving right now. Uh, a movement that will, will help your mobility. You do a set of squats, which if done correctly is a great mobility move, but maybe you do a shoulder thing, a shoulder movement in between your sets of squats with your hinge. Again, maybe an upper body mobility movement. And on your loaded carries, we'll do loaded carries and maybe crawling. Uh, that's the thing we do at, uh, when I work with the military. We mix loaded cr carries with crawls and uh, this one little exercise called cross crawls. We, so I'm, I'm marching in place and my right hand touches my left knee. My left hand touches my right knee. Cross crawls, and that's just one variation. Well, as everyone quickly discovers, mixing cross crawls with farmer walks with crawling is exhausting. Um, but when you get done with it, you've got a nice little, you know, there's a, there's a lot of happiness in your head. Um, I do have a video. I don't know if I ever posted it, uh, but I'm doing, uh, I'm doing skipping uh, cross crawls. So it's a skip motion and you bring, like in this case, I bring my right knee as high as I can and, and tap my, my left hand on it and then skip across to here, skip, skip, skip. I think that exercise, those kinds of exercises where you're blending some fast twitch stuff with some other qualities, whether it's, uh, oh, um, hang on, I'm going too fast. So on that exercise, what I like about that is we're getting Tim Anderson's cross crawling with the fast twitch stuff. Uh, if you do the Olympic snatch uh, and you drop into the bottom position of the squat snatch, um, you're getting mobility, flexibility, explosion, stability, balance. You're getting everything at once. So you're going to have to uh, be smart about how you go into this. Uh, when you say, can, is it okay to train every day as we get older? Um, I have a couple of books in my library that talk about training as you age. And one of them just said something I thought was really important. When you get over 60, and that's your question, uh, every day is should be a training day. You know, every, every single day you should do something. Um, the AARP, um, the, the Association of Retired People, proud member since, I don't know, a long time now, 12 years, 15 years, whatever. Um, they recommend the same thing about doing something every day. So for me, this is my somethings, ready? Three days a week I, I lift. Sometimes it's Olympic lift followed by walking. Sometimes it's bodybuilding movements followed by walking. One day a week, I just go for a rock. I put on a, a weighted vest. I put weights in my hand and I pump my arms like Leonard Schwartz's heavy hands and I wear the rucking vest. Another day of the week, uh, Thursdays, tonic Thursday, completely turn everything down and I do an hour of flexibility, mobility, and original strength. Saturday and Sunday, I always try to do something. 
Saturday's new tradition is to do swings. I have a kettlebell up in my uh, TV room. And if there's American football on, I do swings. Uh, you got to be careful with some of the games. If you do swings during the timeouts, you'll, you'll never move again because there's so many timeouts. Um, if there's, you know, a good rugby game on, and I, I like soccer, football, though those games keep going. So you just have to mentally say, okay, every so often I'm going to do swings. On something like that, you know, if you just did, it doesn't have to be very much at all, you know, five to 10 sets of 10 to 15 reps, I mean, would be plenty, if not excessive. Sunday, the farmer market over at the Wheeler Farm. I always walk over there. Uh, my friend Chris sells the honey that my bees grow over here. Um, and I like to, uh, I always get some fresh veggies and some other things. And the walk is often two or three miles, which is weird because it's right there. But obviously I must do a lot of loops and stuff. So every day I do something, something. It doesn't have to be very much, but try. Uh, I suggest lifting three days a week. I suggest adding some other, some other things in. Um, sprinkle in extra ideas, try new things, learn stuff. Uh, if there's a local place that has a once a week yoga class and it's 10 bucks for eight weeks, like at a senior center or something, go because you're going to learn a ton. Uh, you're going to get a lot of role models, both, both kinds of role models, what you want to be when you're older and what you don't want to be when you're, when you're older. And I think both kinds of role models have value. Okay. Thank you very much. That's a good question. Uh, all the questions today are actually, they're, they're all like that. They're all solid. So I appreciate that. We got a question from Isaac. Now, I don't really have an answer to this, but it made me laugh when I read it. It goes, Dear Dan, I've been thinking with your knowledge of strength and conditioning, could you travel the world with exercises? So here's his workup uh, uh, idea. Turkish get-ups, Turkish, Romanian deadlifts, Bulgarian split squats, Russian twists, French presses, uh, uh, and then he came up with some suggestions of his own, sumo squats from Japan, windmills from Holland, and Cossack lunges. Folks, okay, that's good. Okay, that, you know, there's, uh, I got an offensive uh, stereotypical uh, meme a number of times in the last few years called Irish yoga. And Rob, I'm talking about you because you sent it to me where various people are, you know, passed out drunk in various places. I found it offensive. I laughed. But uh, yeah, I like this idea. Uh, uh, if any of you have ideas uh, of other exercises we may have missed, uh, it, it is funny. You have this list. Uh, <laughs> when I was... Uh, uh, Years ago, we were joking about how many of the words at the time had animal names. And of course, a lot of those have uh, they kind of disappeared. But uh, folks, if you have any other ideas, uh, just put them down there in the comments. And uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Isaac, that that actually made me laugh when I read the question. And uh, that I, I appreciate that more than you know. Okay. Um, Charles asked a question that's filled with debate. Okay. I'm looking for some ideas on kettlebell training this winter to improve my VO2 max. I mountain bike a lot during the rest of the year, along with kettlebell training and steel mace. But in the winter months, I notice a drop in my work capacity, especially cardio. I'm also 43, so I get it. I appreciate you understanding what you said there, but would still like to do my best to keep it up. So years ago, uh, I went to... Uh, I invited a bunch of people over to my house and a book came out and uh, a very, very, very famous person. I showed this book to them and they slammed the book down on my table, which kind of broke my heart because it was a brand new book. And he said, this is all crap from a bull. Uh, I, um, I want to share the sensitive listeners ears when I say that. And what was nice about it, it was, it was such a public display of disgust that we actually started a conversation and he, and he made several good points. And these guys are mountain climbers and bicyclists and a bunch of other fields, you know, areas I, I really don't know as much as I should, I guess. And they all agreed about something important. Uh, years ago, they did a study of 
basketball players, and they discovered that basketball players' VO2 maxes were terrible. Well, I got to tell you from the heart, folks, you know, anybody who's ever been around professional basketball players, when you look at them play, when you look at them move, how can their VO2 max numbers be terrible? Well, they tested these guys, these basketball players, on bicycles. Now, I don't know why the schools don't hire someone like me to point out the obvious all the time. Not a lot of bicycles fit NBA players because NBA players are freakishly big. Moreover, and I, I even followed up on this with a couple of my uh, friends who were in the league at the time, I said, when you were a kid, did you have a bicycle? Well, a lot of the guys from uh, inner cities were like, well, no, because if you had a bicycle, it wouldn't last long. It would get stolen. So a number of the people said in the responses back is that I don't know how to bicycle. It was never part of my life. Now, having said that, it breaks my heart. Two of my basketball playing friends both died uh, after their careers were over in bicycle accidents. And one of my students years ago died in a bicycle accident too. He was killed in one of our southern states and uh, by um, by some drunkens, and uh, the police decided never to follow up on it, which breaks my heart. But VO2 max is extremely specific. Now for you, Charles, being on a bicycle and doing those, you know, those VO2 max things you see online all the time, uh, probably might, <laughs> well, that's convincing, probably might, there's, there's a solid word. Now, your question is, can doing things in the kettlebell world increase your VO2 max? The test would have to be really well designed, but if we're gonna look into this, we would need to have you do like kettlebell snatches, which is a good exercise to get your heart and lung. I mean, I mean, you, you really turn into a freight train doing 200 snatches in 10 minutes with a 24 kilo bell. I know it, I mean, I've done it, it's tough. The question would be with that, doing that Secret Service snatch test carry over into your biking. So in this test, we're gonna have to have this group here, learn kettlebells, you have to all be bicyclists. We're gonna have to have a, a group that uh, doesn't do kettlebells and only does uh, bicycles. And uh, you can already see it's gonna be uh, kind of convoluted, okay? So the test is gonna be interesting because we're gonna have to have a group that just does bicycles and uh, does the VO2 max on a bicycle. We're gonna have to have a group that does kettlebells only and then still tests on a bicycle. And this all has to be done with before and afters. And there'll have to be a third group that does kettlebells plus bicycles and then does the bicycle VO2 test. And then probably a fourth group, I'll do this one, doesn't do anything and then tests VO2 max. Is this gonna work? Well, I think there's some real value in doing kettlebells for your bicycling. Uh, as I've mentioned many times on, on my podcast, um, James, whose website is bikejames.com, been to my house many times, got some great pieces on uh, using kettlebells uh, for uh, uh, mountain biking. Also using isometrics uh, on his kettlebells, he emphasizes the hard style uh, three, the goblet squat, the swing, and the Turkish getup. And I applaud it. I think, I, I really think that's a good idea. Charles, for you, I would probably, a better, I, an idea I want you to think about is using the kettlebell as your off season armor building, using the kettlebell as a way to stay, get yourself in that general training model. You want to come out of it uh, a little leaner. Uh, strong and funny places that you know, we used to say dad strength when the internet used to show up. Just want to be kind of weirdly strong at things. Uh, if you've ever been around wrestlers, that wrestler strength, you know, farmer strength, whatever, and not worry too much about getting the VO2 max from the kettlebell. Is there going to be some carryover? Oh yeah, for your condition? Yeah, no question. Because the bigger you make your general training, generally, the, the more it helps. It's not perfect, the model I use, and I know that, and I've always known that, but you're trending towards pretty good 
with the idea of using kettlebells properly and using the bicycle properly, I think you're you're edging yourself into the right direction. Okay. Mm, thank you. That's it's a good question. Okay. In singles day in the Easy Strength protocol. Uh, now, if you don't know Easy Strength, over at EasyStrengthOmnibook.com or DanJohnUniversity.com slash bookstore. I have two books on easy strength. The question Bill's asking is, is, is a, a good question. Uh, in my even easier strength, which I wrote just to make it even simpler to understand, but the mistake I keep making uh, is I keep trying to make things easier, but the easiest way to make easy strength easy is to do it, not talk about it. Uh, it's just like anything in life. If you want to be good at something, you, you got to, you know, you can buy, you can read all the magazines you want about backpacking, but you're going to learn a ton more by a, you know, six month hike, you know, the Appalachian Trail or something like that. You're going to learn a lot about hiking and backpacking in that six months. You can read, you know, A Walk in the Woods by Bill Bryson, but you're not going to learn as much as you're going to learn by walking, uh, dealing with just, you know, nature for that long. You're going to learn lessons I, you couldn't possibly think about. So I put singles into the program just because so many people, when I first started teaching and coaching Easy Strength, want to know what their maxes were. Personally, I don't think there's any value in testing your max outside of a contest. That's that's certainly a debatable point, but my thought is when you have three judges or whoever your federation has, uh, you have a crowd, you have your, you, they call your name, you step up on the platform. Uh, in my case, usually I have to lose a few pounds or to get down to weight. Uh, my record is, uh, 22, 10 kilos. That was a little bit, that was a little bit of a mistake. Um, you have to wear a singlet, you have to have a registration, uh, Tons of people are filming you. There's pictures. There's all kinds going. To me, that's when you test your max, max, max. For gym maxes, I like doubles because when someone tells me they did something for two, I pretty much believe that they could do it for one. Um, the late, great uh, Bish Delegowitz used to tell me that. He never liked fuzzy logic in the weight room, so he only tested doubles. Now, of course, he would test doubles and the kids would go off by themselves and then test their singles. But he knew the double was the true number, the reliable number. I put easy strength singles in there because people wanted singles. If in my perfect world of easy strength, uh, depending on what day of the week it is, uh, in my weakness, I gave you other options. I should have stuck with just either three sets of three or two sets of five and just said, no, that's it. No changes. None. Just do what I say. Do what I say, you know. I should have done that because it would save me a lot of time and effort. I made the mistake the other day of talking about a variation. And I got to tell you, every question in the inner circle, every email I got, every little forum thing was, oh, can I do that? Can I do that? Can I do that? No, this is for professional athletes who are on, you know, playing 162 games in 180 days. Uh, you know, if you are a professional athlete and you're on one of the teams that uh, uh, I've worked with in the past, you're already doing the program. So, but uh, listen to me ranting. Um, do you need to do the singles day? No, no, not even a bit. But uh, I do have a rule about doing the singles day. Every single set, the load has to go up. Um, so if you're just doing a standard American bar, you know, uh, front squat, 135, 225, 315, 405, 495, 585 for singles. There's your workout. You know, uh, that should be enough for most of my listeners. Uh, so no, um, no, you don't have to. If it's something you do want to check in every so often and test yourself, I prefer you go for doubles, but I certainly understand why a lot of our listeners would want to know what their, their best is for a single. Singles, and I've, I've written about this practically in every book I've ever written. Um, I mean, what do you mean by max? I mean, I've made lifts, made a lift, oh, it's a while ago now, but where, whereas if, if I miss the lift, I take fourth place at the nationals. If I make the lift, I win. Well, 
And I'm sure one of you is, you know, pulling out that little idiotic table because the Soviets came up and they go, oh, you should be able to do this number for a double. <laughs> no, no, that was a make or break effort. That was a one and all, one and done. Um, so that's, that would be the lesson I've learned is when someone says their max is this or that, I almost want to lean in instantly and do the follow -up, famous follow-up question. What do you mean by max? Um, if your bench press max is 405, but you had a, three spotters and all three of the spotters had their hands in the bar and nudged you up, is it really 405? Or do your side spotters have good biceps and your, uh, your back spotter is a great deadlift? as often what I see in high schools and colleges. So if you're gonna do a singles day, keep it in as appropriate. And if you don't wanna do it, whew, eliminate it, okay? Bill, I hope that helped, okay? Edward uh, asks a common question here uh, that we've kind of gotten several variations, but this it's always a good question. This is one of those questions where, like if every podcast had something like this, I would I would answer it every time. As a, a husband and now a father of two girls, the two girl dads, and one of them too, who is starting to worry more about his heart health, I'm looking for a way to get the benefits I used to get from the long, slow swims of my college days, zone two training. You were able to swim in zone two. That, that's, to me, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, uh, when I swim, I cannot. Uh, I did those triathlons when I got back from the Middle East and. Uh, First, I was sick with that parasite, and then uh, I hurt my back uh, picking up a typewriter for someone at the school, which was terribly sad. And then, uh, so I decided to, my doctor recommended swimming and bicycling, and I had to learn to bi bilateral breathe. But even on my best day, my heart rate was always in, I don't know, panic mode as a swimmer. That's, that's good, though. You can do zone two. But using kettlebells instead. I'm currently 33. I've been using kettlebells for about a year. Uh, that's funny you say that because I was, what, 32 and 34 when I became the father of two girls. So, Edward, you and I are like uh, best friends, okay? So, how do you get into condition with kettlebells? Um, for health benefits and kettlebells, let's make sure we're do doing with kettlebells what kettlebells are best at. Um, if you're doing the goblet squat, the Turkish get up, uh, the half kneeling press, those those are three I like a lot. And by the way, hang from a bar, you know. The goblet squat, the Turkish get up, the half kneeling press, and hanging. I love those four exercises. Now, you can say hanging is not a kettlebell exercise. Okay, you win. But what I like about those four exercises is that they challenge not only your um, strength uh, and, and your power and all those other lifting qualities, but they also all put you in positions that gives you a check-in on your flexibility and your mobility, which I think is vital. Uh, it also saves you a lot of time. To get the, in the kettlebell uh, heart and lung world, you know, you're looking at the swings, you're looking at the snatches, and, and I have some programs to do with cleans. So one thing that you can do uh, is very simple, and I recommend this to everybody, uh, is always walk after you lift. Now, I, I don't notice that here, but one of the nice things, you know, I've got this one thing I recommend to some people where it, it's an easy strength protocol, but let, let me just, I'll change it for you for kettlebells. Okay, so I want you to do half kneeling presses. It's the perfect workout. It's easy strength. It's, it's a combination of things. So half kneeling presses, set to eight left, set to eight right, hang from the bar for 30 seconds, three rounds. Um, Goblet squats, maybe three sets of eight. Good. Uh, by the way, right now your ticker's starting to tick. Okay. Uh, toss in, after those goblet squats, toss in some unweighted Turkish get ups, you know, going left, going right. Do it like uh, Pat Flynn recommends. You know, set the timer and do five minutes of them. Set the timer and do 10 minutes of them. After that, um, maybe grab. The, uh, the kettlebell and do five sets of 15 in the, the swing, you know, boom, boom, that's going to get the heart going. Put the kettlebell down in your left hand, make a quick loop, uh, do a suitcase carry, take a quick loop, suitcase carry with the right hand, and then go for a walk. 
Um, there's your basic kettlebell stuff. What's great about that five sets of 15 is that's going to jump your heart rate up. The suitcase carry is going to bring it down a little bit. And then your walk, because your heart's been going boom, 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 boom. As you walk, you're going to find your, you're going to find yourself, your heart rate will remain elevated, but not in that high elevations uh, that we have here in Utah. Uh, my gym is at 4,330 feet or something like that. Uh, it's real easy to run out of breath when we're training here. So I would suggest doing stuff along that line. If you have the workout generator, um, you just fall along in that and just, you know, just, t you know, when you, when it says what equipment you have, just say kettlebell and you'll get a nice kettlebell workout. If that's what I told you isn't something you want to do, but I would, I would recommend full body challenges, half million press, uh, goblet squats. I like the goblet squat and the overhead stick, uh, squat because it is a challenge, your mobility and flexibility on top of the challenge it is to your, uh, you know, your, your, your mobility in your, in your uh, goblet squat and the strength from the goblet squat. And then from there, add those walks and I think things will be pretty good. I wanna take a pause here because the question from Alex is, you know, it's pretty personal, but it's really good. So, you know, each day I have this little uh, pirate map for my life and uh, number six is, no, pardon me, number five is make a difference. And I just feel like this question, um, maybe this is not a fitness question, but maybe this would be the, this would be the one my mom would want me to answer, okay? My question to you is more on the personal level and not on the fit, fitness level, if that's all right with you. He just faced one of the hardest times in my life. I had to call off my wedding two weeks before the wedding date due to some truly devastating revelations. I'm, I'm sorry, Alex, that's tough. Could you give me advice on how you face personal challenges? How would you stay positive in such times? To be honest, I am worried I can never trust or love any again after this. My friends and family say time will go by and it will get better. I truly hope that's true. I just want to ask from an outside perspective, since your approach to life and fitness always resonate with me and seems very logical to me. Well, thank you, Alex. First off, Alex, thank you for trusting me. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, I don't know how many, some of the, some of the, some of our listeners are probably bored with my stories of the last five years, but, uh, you know, when I was in England and I found out my brother Phil had died and it just, it just seems like the, 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 the webbing of my life just kind of ripped apart. I've actually read some very negative comments, uh, on this, uh, even in my own, the, the quotes or the comments underneath about some of the things and there's there's another site online that makes fun of me because of my personal tragedies so alex uh as much as i'm pulling for you just remember there's people who are just you know not pulling for you okay so what do you do you know john dunn you know in that poem no man is an island he he's that's the first kind of hint that might help you out here first off i would strongly suggest you get some help um uh, you didn't even, I'm guessing about what happened, but there are, uh, 12 step programs that deal with some of the issues here. But one of the things that really helped me was I reached out and I got, I got therapy. I got help. Um, as I, I tell my therapist sometimes he, he's probably prevented more murders than, uh, you know, Columbo. Uh, well, you, there are some things you need to talk about. Uh, the fact that you reached out to me is a good start. Uh, I know people are going to tell you things like there's plenty of fish in the sea and you can't judge this. That, that's great. And it's probably true, but the heart, <laughs> the, the heart is, is a tough, is a tough organ to heal. Um, so for me, I got help and there's a couple of things, a couple of tools that really helped me the most. The first thing is this concept called reframing. So when you make a statement that's got some absolutes to it, um, um, for example, you got an absolute in this line here. It's the hardest time in my life. Well, 
one of the things you want to do in reframing is just take that statement and then just say it a different way. You know, uh, you might want to just go way into the future and say, my future Alex will look back on this and say, this was one of many hard times in his life. Uh, there will be other hard times and it doesn't have to be devastating hard times, but Hey, we all get flat tires and, you know, cars don't start sometimes. And, you know, I don't, and a thousand other issues. Uh, reframing is this technique where you, you take things and you just say it a different way. One way you can reframe on this particular thing is what if you'd have found out two weeks after the wedding that right there, because once you say I do and sign the paperwork, that's permanent. That is, I mean, when you're filling out your social security forms, they're going to ask you about all this stuff. Uh, I've, I do all these background checks for all these organizations. I have to fill out all kinds of stuff there. Um, so reframing actually can be a very helpful technique. Um, when I was in grief therapy, the, we had one person kind of came in and taught, it was a terrible story, but they're the, these parents of a, of a young woman who, who died in a plane crash, the parents couldn't get over it. And what the, the grief therapist did, I think is really interesting. She, she, she got the autopsy and found out that the girl had died long before the plane crashed. And strangely, and this is, this is horrible to talk about, but the parents image of what happened is what she died on impact and all these terrible things happened to her. And she had the, no, she was already, she's already passed before any of that happened. And it gave them a very strange feeling of relief. And I can understand, I didn't understand at the time, but now I have kids. I think I understand it better. So the first thing would be reframing. The second thing is you're going to have to establish uh, your own personal boundaries somehow. Um, I don't know how public this is, but I guarantee in your world, this is a very public event. So you're going to have to make sure you, you armor up your own boundaries. Um, you know, there's actually, it's weird to think this, but there, I've got a, a book over there by Coonrant, I think the name is, it's called the game of work. And, uh, it really helped me as a coach, really helped me as a, a teacher. And in times of trouble, it helps me as a human person. Uh, there are certain things in life that are out of bounds. Um, they, they, they are, your friends need to know that, okay, we can talk about this, but we can't talk about that. Maybe your family members. It's okay for us to bring this up, but you're not allowed to poke fun at me when we talk about it. And if someone chooses to poke fun at you, Alex, because of this event, they're not your friend. They're not your family. And I don't want to hear all the macho posturing. Sometimes people who care for you also care for you. And they know, I mean, the cheap shots are the, are the weak shots. Yeah. Um, the third thing I'd like to encourage you to think about is your own values. Uh, with my inner circle, with uh, some other people I work with, uh, we do a values assignment. And they're all over the internet. I'm sure you, can, you, know, you, you circle or check off. What, what you value, and they're just words. Uh, my top two are fitness and order, and it's weird to say that, but then I look at everything I do and it makes sense. But once you kind of get a grip on what your values are, uh, the things you value, the, the, maybe, maybe it's discipline and integrity, okay? I, or maybe it's honesty and the other thing. Then what you do is you put your values down on a piece of paper, and then you start to think about through the lens of your values, you say, okay, you know, if the most important thing in Dan John's life is order, and yet, you know, I don't know, I'm just looking at my desk right now, and uh, you can tell I, I, I just finished the book because there's, and it's actually, it's still pretty clean considering what I've seen in other people's desks look like. Yep. Order is important to me, you know, uh, I, you know, I do laundry a certain day of the week. I do, I, sh you know, I shop a certain day of the week. Order is a big thing to me. Uh, training a certain order makes sense. Teaching a certain order. Uh, I don't know what your values are, but once you have your own values and you really believe in them and you've got to test them, you got to test them with maybe, 
you know, what your master's degree or what your major was or what was your favorite subject or what, who was your favorite teacher uh, sometime. And when you look at your values and something as simple as your favorite teacher or coach, you'll go, oh, I see why that teacher made more sense because that teacher honored, you know, discipline or integrity or whatever. Um, you know, I remember, I remember literally putting out the timelines when I was going through the worst times of my life um, because of my background in this grief therapy stuff. You know, I knew the averages of certain things, how long it would take to get over this or take to get over that. And I can remember writing these things down and saying, okay, I should be fine. And I'd circle it, you know, I'd say, okay, by this date, you know, that's not the way, that's not the way things work. But actually, in my case, because order is such an important thing, don't worry. Okay, maybe I'm out of, my brain's all over the place now, but it'll be back to order, you know, 18 months from now. As you, as you're, thinking through things and you're, and you're, and you're kind of, you know, getting out of bed every day and stepping forward and taking care of everything. Um, just remember that, you know, and, and your friends are right. These, this, this shall pass. Uh, but man, it's hell to go through. Uh, if I can give you any advice, uh, I don't, I was going to start with sleep, but let me just, let me get back to that because sleep can be tough. There are some sleep supplements that are really, really good. In fact, uh, well, Utah isn't one of the states that allows that particular one, but uh, there are some sleep supplements that help some people through the tough times. Um, I like, I, one thing I think is really helpful is if you can exercise every single day. I've written articles about, I don't believe in working out, but sometimes I go into the gym to work it out. I work out my struggles. I work out, you know, the joys and problems of being a parent, the joys and problems of being a, a neighbor, uh, a citizen, you know, all this stuff. Working out might be something that'll help you work out some of this stuff. Uh, take care of your nutrition, protein, veggies, water. It's not even a conversation piece anymore. Um, I would give you, I would warn you about drugs and alcohol, man. Uh, alcohol is a is a dangerous depressant. And uh, listen, I I love drinking. I mean, I'm I'm in fact. Uh, uh, I like, you know, I, you know, I go, you know, every Monday night I go to a trivia game at the Ice House. It's a, a local bar. I love it. Uh, I love hanging out and doing things with people. I love those backyard celebrations. But you're in a place right now where you're going to really have to be very careful about anything that even sniffs of depressants uh, because it's just, you're, you're, you're going through the dark night of the soul. Um, Professional help might be a really good option for you. Therapy, um, <laughs> long walks on the beaches. I mean, I mean, I, I, I'm just I, I'm worried I'm turning to cliche fest. But uh, therapy will help. Training will help. Proper nutrition, proper sleep, proper recovery. Um, think of it as a you know. I mean, I I went at I went at it with that warrior athlete mindset, it, and I don't know if that's good or bad, but it helped me a lot. Um, Alex, thank you. You know, you, you ask a last a, a question. Uh, I'm worried I could never trust or love again after this. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I mean, how many songs a year come out, you know, you know, Dionne Warwick, I'll never fall in love again. You know, it's just, it is something and it's tough. Uh, I do want you to keep me informed about what's going on. You can send an update to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, if you're serious, that'll get sent to me and I'll, we'll start, we, we can have some conversations and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to do the cliche to you cause that's not fair cause I can't tell the future, but you will, it will get better. Uh, it will be a bit of a roller coaster. There's going to be ups and downs and ups and downs. Uh, you're going to be fine until you're not. Um, I still can't be around certain people for good reasons. Uh, I, I just, I'm just not there yet. Uh, I try to avoid certain places. Uh, for me, the best answer for me is to get things done and take care of business, be the best dad and grandfather I can be, the big, best neighbor I can be. And, uh, and, and there you go. I hope that was helpful. For those of you just listening in, uh, 
keep keep Alex in your thoughts because uh, you know, we used to have a joke at Judge Memorial, it's your turn in the barrel, you know, when uh, we, we had a certain principal that just seemed to pick a faculty member of the week just to, you know, make life miserable for it. I remember one of my coworkers just looked at somebody else and said, oh, it's your turn in the barrel this week. It's, it's a joke, it's offensive, but it's funny. All right, well, Alex, thank you. And uh, gentle listeners, thanks for letting me uh, say some of that. Thank you. Oh, it looks like our last question is from Derek. I was wondering if it is acceptable or even advisable to switch in a day or two a week of the armor building complex while doing easy strength for fat loss to keep up conditioning and toughness gain through the swing challenge that I completed recently. Also, do you see any problems with rowing instead of walking in the easy strength for fat loss program? You know, well, yeah, let me just answer the, the easy strength for fat loss. It would, it, it would be fine, but you're going to have to, I mean, I had that concept two rower. You're going to have to find a pace that is uh, very kind of uh, gentle. But yes, the answer is yes. Stationary bikes, treadmills. Um, the downside of like air, you know, the airdyne and the row is that because you're using so much, the heart rate does get a bit high. So you're gonna to have to be kind of a row gently, row long kind of attitude here. You know, I don't want you trying to um, destroy yourself on those rows or any any other thing you do. The reason I like walking so much is that most of us naturally know how to tune the walking level down. Uh, I still love Millie Brown's uh, talk test. Um, she wrote Low Stress Fitness decades ago, and she gave us the talk test. Uh, and that's the ability to have a kind of a conversation while while you're rowing. Now, when I'm in my numbers, because of, it's funny when people make fun of me breathing hard and online. Um, I've had lung issues since birth. Uh, I thank God for penicillin, man. But, uh, so I, I breathe like, <laughs> so, so when I'm doing the talk test, I still, hey, how are you today? You know, it's kind of like that. Um, armor building complex to easy strength for fat loss or armor building complex to any program is always a good idea. I just finished a book where armor building complex is the focus. And the ABC is great because it does give you an interesting level of hypertrophy work at the same time working on your metabolic conditioning. Uh, a phrase that Arthur Jones and Ellington Darden, I think, originally came up with, and then they got destroyed and overused by everybody else. But there is a value in the ABC for hypertrophy work, for general conditioning, and the original reason to finish off a kettlebell certification. Um, can you dose it in with uh, easy strength for fat loss? Sure. Um, why don't you do it this way though? Uh, find find a pretty broad day, a wide open day. For, for me, it would be Saturdays generally. And then maybe do 15, 20, maybe more if you like, rounds of the ABC, and then just go for a walk. But don't do the easy strength with it. Just make it separate. And uh, so maybe four days ES for fat loss, and then that one extra day. Uh, my concern is that when you're doing a fat loss program, Sometimes, you know, we're, we're burning the candle a little bit because, you know, if you're doing it the way I recommend, you're fasting, you're drinking a ton of coffee, you're doing the workout, you're going for the walk, and then, you know, you haven't eaten since six o'clock the night before, and now it's like eight, nine, ten in the morning, whatever, or however you work it out, doesn't matter. Uh, and I just, I just don't want you to get yourself in a, in a situation where you, you you're, you're you're gassing out in the workout, and that's not leaving you any uh, any room to have your body relax enough so it can burn fat. You know, remember that research? It's in the Easy Train for Fat Loss book. It still just makes me laugh. Yeah, the three best ways, the three most efficient ways for a human to lose body fat are walking, sitting, and sleeping. And uh, when I read that study, I just laughed out loud because. That's not what you see people doing at gyms. And uh, so uh, if you can get rid of all the crappy carbohydrates out of the American diet and make Americans walk more, uh, I think a lot of the, uh, the, the issues we have with, uh, 
uh, all those related diseases would, would uh, ease up a bit. Uh, good question, Derek, and thank you so much. It's good. Well, there you go. Uh, that's episode 238. A uh, lot of fun questions today. Real, a real serious question today. Um, I'm still thinking about this uh, geography workout. Uh, the uh, and so if you have more ideas, um, you know. Sadly, most of the other exercises I thought of were named after people: the hack, hack squat, the Saxon side bend. You know, uh, I got to come up with some with some more countries. Um, remember, if you have questions podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. And until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thank you.